One typical nightmare is that one is per pursued by some terrible or demonic or unknown power and one runs and runs for one's life and knowing all the time in the dream that finally they will get one and you hide and you can't hide and and they will see you and you look for another hiding place and they will discover you again and you run and run persecution always means something wants to come to us the only way to meet a persecuting demon is to turn around and to say, here I am, what do you want from me? Then the nightmarish pursuer generally changes face. It simply represents that we have turned away from some part of our psyche and therefore it runs after us, it wants to get at us, literally. And, but we don't want it. The unconscious shows us the face we show it. If we reject something within us, then it becomes destructive to us. And if we don't reject it, that's what I mean by saying, turning around and saying, what do you, in a friendly manner, what do you want? Then you suddenly see that it isn't so bad. Then you have a chance that whatever pursues one has, shows a, a more amenable face and that one can make some pact with it or some arrangement. Most people are not fully aware of all their personality traits. We like to imagine ourselves as being intelligent or generous or good-natured or practically gifted and whatnot. And there are other qualities of our conscious personality, inferior qualities, which we know somewhere, I mean, the surroundings tell us about them generally, and in quarrels it comes out, but we tend to push it into the shadow. We don't look at it, and when we think about ourselves, we forget about these qualities. Only our best friends and people we live with, our marital partners, can generally very clearly point out these more inferior traits. Because of wanting to play a social role, most people identify more with their positive qualities, and therefore the shadow is generally more awkward, inferior, sometimes a bit evil, or uh, socially unadapted. But that is not always so. There are people who prefer to live their worst side, and then their shadow is positive. There has been made studies among criminals who live, so to speak, the worst side of their personality. And then they have a positive shadow. They have a, a well-meaning helper of man as a shadow figure. But the normal average is that we identify or prefer to identify more with our positive and developed traits of character and therefore push more the inferior side into the shadow. The most famous example is Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There, in, that is a literary representation where we can really see how man and his shadow live together and act upon each other. Everybody casts a shadow, so to speak, by the very fact that we are, for instance, if we use a lot of intellectual thinking, our feeling will be relatively inferior or undeveloped because we don't give it enough time. Or somebody who works mostly with machines and technical things tends to neglect his fantasy, his passive fantasizing or his artistic gifts. And so if we repress the shadow, we are only half people. That's why there are in literature such tales that the devil steals the shadow from people and then they are, so to speak, in the claws of the devil because we need a shadow. The shadow is what keeps us down to earth, which reminds us of our incompleteness and which also provides us with complementations. We would be very poor if we were only what we imagine to be. I would say whenever we are tired or under stress, another personality breaks through. For instance, people who are very well-meaning and helpful suddenly become ruthlessly egocentric, push everybody else aside and become very nasty. Also, for instance, when people have the flu or are ill, suddenly you see their shadow side coming through. 
or for instance people you have people who are always in a good mood and uh, cheerful and enterprising and one day they become suddenly like ill-tempered bears and you feeling I've never seen that person that way there's a sudden change of character that's the breaking through of the shadow it can take on thousand forms or for instance you have a very good friend and just and he lends you a book and just that book your friend loses he wanted he wants to nothing the last thing to do but his shadow wanted to play you a trick that happens very often when people are jealous of each other when they play to the person of whom they are jealous they play nasty tricks they lose their objects or they don't keep the appointments and so on and it, they have the best of intentions but their shadow plays a role and does nasty tricks behind their own back it's well known that for instance policemen and criminals have a, a shadow relationship to each other. Criminals are very good policemen if one makes them into one. And many policemen fight their own shadow in the outer form of criminals and would have a criminal inclination themselves if they weren't policemen. And that is only one example which is well known in criminalistics and uh, we have all our favorite enemy, our best enemy, so to speak. That is generally our shadow. We have to, if, if somebody gets on one's nerves without reason, if somebody does some harm to you, then you can't say, it's natural that you hate him or her. But if somebody doesn't do special harm to you and you just feel madly irritated every time the, that person enters the room you you could just spit at them then you can be sure that's the shadow the best way then is to sit down and write a little paper on the characteristic of that person and then look at it and say that's that's me <laughs> i have done that once when i was 18 and i blushed so that i was sweating blue in the face when i had done that it's a real shock to see one's shadow. The more the people are righteous and therefore never leave their shadow side, the more they project it. The others are always the evildoers and that's where they live in a constant righteous indignation and, and really hunting down their own shadow in the form of the outer person. The community expects them to always be mild and friendly and helpful and virtuous. And uh, the poor man or woman has a shadow too naturally. So then they can't live their shadow. And if they live it, the whole community howls against them. And so they generally spend their relationship to evil by seeing it in other people and preaching against it. Is that too poisonous? <laughs> it is so terribly awkward to live and to be aware of one's own shadow that if somebody else within a group or let's say in a family does something nasty everybody is relieved because now you can say it's the other who did it. We have a proverb the good man pays great attention if the other does also evil. So they can say ah it's the other it's not me. And that plays a great role in the so-called scapegoat psychology and how in certain groups and mainly also in a family sometimes one child or one member of the family takes on the role of doing all the evil the other would like to do and don't dare to do. And then the others push that person more and more into that evil role. And probably even in the criminal in society has a similar role. He's like a, a negative redeemer. He redeems society from having to face its own shadow because then they can say, it's that fellow who did the murder. I only wished to do it but didn't do, dare to do it. And so if somebody has a, a weak personality, a weak ego, he can even succumb to suggestions and do act out shadow things which other people really d wish or desire. It's very difficult. In, in the shadow side of our personality we are very much mixed up with the surrounding world and it's very difficult and therefore it is very important 
to know our shadow and to keep it out of the, of the group phenomenon. Otherwise we weigh down our surrounding with all our unlived nasty qualities. And that's why, for instance, in the antiquity, the old Greeks and the old Jews and many other populations have the idea of a purification of the community by choosing some people as scapegoats and sacrificing them or driving them out into the desert. And they take all the sins of the community with them. They, they carry the projection, they are the shadow, they pay for it. And then the others feel, so to speak, all right again. And perhaps some, some people can also remember that at a party, as they say, the, the devil suddenly got into them. And with a little bit of alcohol, they suddenly misbehave terribly. And the next morning when they wake up, they can't understand how they did all these things and said all these th things they said. That is a, generally not only a breakthrough of their own shadow, but of the group shadow the evil of, they acted out it, not only their own evil, but the evil of all other people as well. Because, as we know from the life history of Marilyn Monroe, she, she did not live her own life. She, she acted all the time the anima of men. Uh, generally, there are women, and that is ultimately due to the power drive. When women discover that if they are beautiful, they can exert a magic power over men, then they take to acting all the time the anima. We are even in our jargon sometimes talking about anima women. Those are women who find out how to act the anima to men. And beca but because this is not love, but pure power drive, it is destructive to the men and to themselves because it has, it's using the guise of love for, for worldly power. Such women want to rule the men, they want to, uh, the men to be all at their feet, and then they, they naturally are unhappy because they don't feel loved. Uh, I remember when I was young, uh, Sometimes when a man projected the, his anima onto me and was pursuing me and giving me presents and so on, I had the distinct feeling, but that fellow doesn't know me at all. He's chasing an image. I wanted to look back. Who, he, who is he chasing? It's not me. Me as a human being, he doesn't see. And so if a woman falls into the trap of acting out the anima, she can exert a tremendous power over men. But at the same time, inwardly, she's frustrated because those men love her image, they don't love her. So she's really very lonely underneath. And that's what caught up with poor Marilyn Monroe. It works as long as it is a, an adventure or a love affair. Then she f fills out his needs. But when he has to live with her, in every, if he marries her and has to live with her in everyday life, then comes the trouble. A, she will play the anima to all the other men as well, and he'll not like that. And secondly, he'll suddenly discover that underneath that beautiful mask, there is no human being, there is no warmth, there is no possibility of a human relationship. So to marry an anima figure is most disappointing. And that, these women who play that are called by the French femme fatale, women who ruin men. He tends to idealize women. He sees in every woman the Beatrice of Dante, so to speak, or the Virgin Mary. And then uh, such men cannot approach women again with their lower part, with sexually and in ordinary human life. Or they have a split anima situation. They admire a very unapproachable, lofty, beautiful girl from afar and satisfy their sexual desires with prostitutes and cannot bring the two ends together. They cannot put the princess and the bitch together, so to speak, in their psyche. And that is generally due to a too close tie to the mother in the man. He has to free himself from the mother. There exist in reality fathers who think they have to 
anxiously protect the integrity of their daughters and therefore pursue them when they write notes to their first boyfriend and so on. But here this is no longer the case as this woman is married and away from home. So she is doing that again to herself and that is the greatest tragedy about the negative animus that it always flares up with its power when where a woman loves whenever a woman loves somebody a man or somebody the animus comes and wants to cut it off the negative animus tries to cut off women from any kind of relationship by belittling the relationship or calling it crazy or by some other means. The negative animus mainly manifests as an opinionated resistance against having feelings of love. And that's why especially if a woman has a tendency to fall in love or to be even only interested in a man, then her animus comes up and makes her ruin the relationship. Subjectively, you think you are under a curse. Just when you want to meet the man or talk to the man you love, something makes you make him a scene, a tearful scene. And then you go home and cry and you say, I wanted to have a good relationship to him and now... And then either you project and you say, and he is so nasty to me, or you are a bit more honest and then you say, and just because I want a relationship to him, I have made him a scene. And you just don't know what devil's mechanism makes you do that. But, but women always hit, if a woman hits you as a man, you can be sure she's interested in you. <laughs> <laughs> and she would really want to love you, but she doesn't know how to, how, how to do it. The a negative animus behaves here like a jealous lover. He wants to keep the woman and cut her off from all men. That is the typical mechanism when, when she... She, she has some loving feelings towards uh, any man, then come, up comes this sh you should not do that animus. Or it's projected. I know classical case of a woman who once attacked Jung in the analytical hour worse than ever with the animus and they went into what happened in the hour, happened before. Jung had told her whenever you have a feeling that's when you attack. She had, on the way to Jung, seen beautiful strawberries and her first impulse was, let's buy them and bring them to him. And then the animus said, oh, he will say strawberries have an erotic meaning and he'll mock at me. So she didn't buy the strawberries. And then she arrived in a fierce mood and attacked Jung all the hour. Just because she had suppressed the strawberries. Just because if she had bought the strawberries, everything would have gone well, but she had repressed her own feeling. Our field of consciousness is entered by autonomous complexes. You can notice that if you watch your own trend of thoughts, then for instance you are in a friendly, loving mood and then you suddenly think of something negative and then uh, hatred and bitterness enters the scene and a quarter of an hour later you use revenge about the something which has been done to you and then your inner scene changes again and you think of something else and you get again in we constantly switch moods and therefore if we watch ourselves we are many people I could give you a whole list of well, what kind of persons I can be. I can be an old peasant woman who thinks of cooking the end of the house. I am a scholar who thinks about deciphering manuscripts. I am a psychotherapist who thinks about how to interpret people's dreams. I am a mischievous little boy who enjoys the company of 10 years old and playing mischief to adults and so on. I could give you 20 more such characters and, and they suddenly enter you and if you know it you can steer it you can for instance keep them out of your system or play them and put them aside again but if you are possessed it means they enter you involuntarily and you act it out involuntarily now for instance the mischievous person I can call up and send back to sleep again when I feel now there's enough I can't afford that yet now that's not possession. And so th that is one of the aims of psychotherapy, to, to help people to, 
to get on with their inner family of souls without getting possessed by them and to keep a constant identity of themselves. Now, the animus is the most frequent possession in a woman, that she's certainly entered by a mood of male determination, cold, generalizing thinking, opinions, or an impulse towards rash, brutal, determined action, which is not at all in her feminine character which changes her character. You, you even see in a woman when she gets possessed by the animus that her face expression changes, her eyes change, her mouth, expression of her mouth changes. There is a place for a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman. Otherwise, the <laughs> nature has made them that way. It doesn't need to have a, an attitude of dominance. You can just as well say, make love to her just as much an expression of love. So you can say a man can sometimes break the animus possession of his wife by making love to her. It all depends how he does it. If he has real feelings, it will reach her. If he acts that way, nothing happens. It only goes wrong. That's why I never advise it when I analyze a man to do such a thing, because then he would do it acting. He would act it because I told him, and then it would certainly go wrong. It only goes right if he really has a positive feeling, a wave of positive, warm feeling towards her. He has no, not to take all that bullshit because it will only get worse and worse and worse. But he has to, and therefore he has to refuse all that nonsense and say, when you talk in that whiny baby way to me, all sorts of nonsense, I'm not, go I'm not even going to listen. But he must at the same time make a gesture that the woman feels, if only she were herself, he would love her. For a man to, to deal with an animus possessed woman is to love, to give her one, to give a hand to the woman to say, I love you, I still love you, and to slap the animus at the same time. So that the woman feels, when I'm myself, he still loves me. When I'm not myself, he gets angry. And by that, the man can help the woman out. Then she begins to notice what is herself and what is not herself. Is it, we will see it's the same, the same thing with the anima of a man. One cannot say that ahead. Generally, when people fall in love like that in one second, it is mostly projection, and many marriages are concluded on the basis of complete projection. And then comes, therefore, generally a period of disillusionment where both partners discover that he or she are very different from what they had thought they were. And then comes the great test. Can they now build up a real relationship after the projection has gone, or is nothing left? After the projection is gone, there's nothing left. There are two strangers staring at each other's fa face and saying to themselves, how could I? And that one can only decide on the dreams. I have very often analyzed couple where after work through the animus animal projections, uh, one or both partners dreamt that now they could get married and, had a, and they dreamt of a real going to church and having a marriage ceremony and getting married at last. As if one could say the removing of the projection has made it possible to be really related. This time for good. No, with open eyes knowing, saying yes to each other with open eyes and knowing each other. Well, before that was a kind of blind infatuation. Well, in the transference, which is an expression which Jung took actually over from Freud, and Freud thought it was purely a projection of the parental image onto the partner and so on, and an Oedipal or Electra complex projected. That's why at the end of a Freudian therapy you cut off, goodbye, we have never known each other. Projections are handed back and goodbye. While we think certainly in the beginning stages of the relationship there is generally a lot of projection mixed up with it. And that is responsible for all those love quarrels. I mean, she makes demands which he can't fulfill and he makes demands she can't fulfill and animus anima uh, crossing the swords. And I mean, if you tape record a love quarrel, it's the same all over the world. 
literally. And that is projection. And if people don't run away, but work it out and take back all what is projection in it, then appears or is peeled out of all this the true relationship. Now it might be none. And then it would be like the Freudian thing, goodbye, and uh, now I see you simply represented that and that in me, and thank you very much, goodbye. Or there might be a tremendous amount of relationship, to relationship built up, which is not the same thing as projection. All these kind of compulsivenesses, people cry if you don't see them often enough, and childish demands, and all that kind of trouble. And then it gets replaced slowly or purified into what you could call an objective relationship. The image of God or a goddess is, if that is projected, it makes for a very, very violent transference. And then slowly one discovers, naturally, no partner can fulfill the role of a god. If you ask the other to be a god or a goddess, you will certainly be disappointed sooner or later.